getting the most out of every ingredient. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Blender Collection. Hi everyone and welcome to the British Library. Um, I'm Melissa Thompson and guest co-director of this year's food season alongside um, fellow guest co-director Angela Clutton and um, the founder and curator Polly Russell. Um, before I introduce the event, a massive thank you to our sponsors KitchenAid, um, without whom the food season wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible. And also they've got a competition running to win an espresso machine, one of three espresso machines on their website, on the food season website, sorry. So go and have a look. Um, tonight's event um, encapsulates everything that the food season is about, um, looking at food, its consumption and the politics around it. What do prisoners eat? Um, should we care about what prisoners eat? And, um, and if we should care, why? Um, hosting tonight is the brilliant Kimberly Wilson, um, a chartered psychologist and lecturer and author whose mm. work looks at the role that food and lifestyle plays in our mental health. Um, and she also runs a brilliant podcast, Stronger Minds, um, and past episodes have touched on issues um, that we'll be discussing tonight, and they're brilliant. I really um, thoroughly recommend them. Um, Sophie Barton Hawkins um, has spent time inside as a prisoner and now campaigns for better con conditions on the inside um, using her experiences. And she'll also share her experiences, past experiences, um, and some of the ingenious ways um, ingenious methods employed um, by prisoners to eat better. It's, it's fascinating. Um, and then Lucy Vincent, who founded the charity um, Food Behind Bars, which campaigns for better food in prisons. And, um, and they run um, uh, cooking lessons. I've, I've been into one of their prisons. I'm not one of their prisons, they don't run it, but I've been into one of the prisons they work with. Um, and the enthusiasm from the prisoners is, is incredible. And they also um, have um, uh, kitchen gardens. And the first um, butchery um, offering classes uh, to uh, a butcher in, inside a prison, women's prison, two days a week, which I think is incredible. They do really vital work. Um, so that's our, our panel, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa, and I would like to echo and extend our thanks also to Angela and Polly, um, not just for this fantastic food season, but also this particular opportunity, because just sitting in the green room, we all have a shared experience of, of how lonely it is to be advocating for improved conditions, improved food, and just generally for kind of sympathy and empathy for prisons and, and prisoners. So thank you very much for giving us this platform and this opportunity. Thank you to all of you for giving up your time to join us and be part of this conversation. Um, and it will be a conversation. We're going to run it like a little fireside chat, I think. Very cosy. A little cosy <laughs> chat with a little bit of political manifesto and campaigning on the side. So um, hopefully you will have lots of questions because what the plan is is that we will talk for about an hour or so, and then we will open up the floor for your questions and comments. So do hold on to your questions uh, until the end, and we can do those all at once. But I guess we shouldn't waste the opportunity that we've been given. Um, but to perhaps set the scene in terms of food, I thought I would start by asking both of you mm. to tell me about your comfort food. Mm. Shall I go first, so, though? Mine's Chicken Kiev, actually. Someone's asked me this question quite recently, and it is, um, yeah, Chicken Kiev chips, which is sometimes controversial because there's a lot of mash fans about. <laughs> but personally, mash is not my favourite way of using a potato. So it's got to be chips and peas. Um, and maybe and a bit... why is that? I Where don't do know. Do you know what it is? It's like, it's just, yeah, childhood food, I guess. Um, yeah, easy kind of end of the week. I don't know, it's, if I ever kind of have a long week and there's nothing in the house, if I ever crave two things, it's like, yeah, chicken Kiev vibe or a bowl of pasta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of my other one, really. Um, yeah. Sophie? Oh, this is a hard one. Um, <laughs> I think for me, my comfort food would be probably tuna pasta melts because 
comfort food should be quick so that you can just sit down and eat it. Mm -hmm. So tuna, mayonnaise, cheese, sweet corn, onion, hot pasta, mix it all in, sit Ooh. down with a fork, dig in, <laughs> introduce it to my nieces who live with me and it's now one of their favourite foods too. And you're just warm and stodgy afterwards, it's good. Do you remember when the first time was you, you made it? Where, where was the kind of birth of this delicious dish? Probably when I moved out of home and I was mm. about 18 or 19 and I just looked to my cupboards and went, oh, I don't have much food, what can I make? And I made that and it was good. And so it's been a staple ever since. And I, I think both of you touch on one of the features of food. So I, we all come to food, I think, from a different direction. We come to prison food from, from different positions. But what we know about food is its role in connection and place, in comfort and soothing, and of course through nourishment. And certainly for me, the argument in favour of improving food in prisons, and we'll speak to Sophie in a moment about the, the state of food in prisons, just so that we are all on, on the same page on this, is that food, good quality food, nutritious nutrient-dense food shouldn't be considered a luxury. Our, our bodies are made of food, our brains are made of food. If you want someone's brain to function well, if we're talking about, for example, rehabilitation and people learning to manage their impulse control and to be less aggressive and less violent, then you need brains that are working well. And in order to do that, you need brains that are well nourished. And so even from a basic rehabilitation, recidivism, prison safety position, decent quality food should be high on the agenda. Um, and I, I think certainly what I have come up against in the past when talking about prison food is the idea that well, prison's a holiday camp, mm. isn't it? Mm. You just, you've got your own room, your own TV <laughs> and playstations. Holloway had a swimming pool. Um, <laughs> and so if prison was so easy, actually shouldn't food be part of the punishment? Shouldn't food be part of the reason that it's hard to be in prison and you don't want to come back? But Sophie, could you tell us something about what the food in prison was like and what the effect of the food in prison was on you and your fellow prisoners? So the food in prison is very basic. Um, it's very carb heavy, it's very beige. Um, all my friends would test the fact that I don't eat a great deal of beige food and I think that stems back to being in prison. It's cheap, it's easy to make, you don't need any skill to be cooking in the kitchens in prison generally. Um, it's not made of any thoughts or feelings or care. And you get your food and you go and sit in your cell, you're three foot from an open toilet, and you eat your food on your own, not behind the door. Then you've got to wash out your plate in your sink that you've got to use to brush your teeth and you know wash your body in. So that it's not just the food, it's the environment around the consuming of the food that is such a big issue in prison mm. for me. And just the quality is so poor. You eat, you sleep. You get up, you go to work, you eat, you sleep. That's pretty much it. Mm. Within, you know, eat two hours bang up straight after lunch, you're sleeping for two hours straight away. That's not normal. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I've just... In March, I worked in, um, in Brixton Prison. We were doing a street food course there. And, and we had one session in the morning, had one session in the afternoon. And the afternoon one was after lunch. And um, I was going around and <laughs> knocking and, and getting our guys, basically, for the afternoon session. And I was going to their cell and they were fast asleep. You know, and, and that was actually the first time I'd seen that. You know, I'd heard about prisoners saying to me, you know, we just have our lunch and we're banged up, so there's nothing to do, so we just go back to sleep. But it was actually quite shocking for me. It was two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and I felt awful dragging them out to a, a classroom <laughs> when they were, you know, in a dark cell, um, asleep after their lunch. Um, your whole routine is out of work, mm. I think. Mm. Yeah. And I think, just to pick up on, on the kind of the, the question about quality, one of the reasons the quality of food is, in prisons is so bad is because the budget for food in prisons is so low. So, um, we know that in order to meet the UK's, the UK government's eat well guidance for a healthy meal, you need to spend about 5 99 mm. on your ingredients for an adult. And the budget for a meal, for a full day, so three meals a day in a prison is, is just under two pounds. And so we're spending a third mm -hmm. of the budget that the government knows you need in order for someone to have a healthy, adequate diet 
on people who actually can't choose anything else to eat because it's different, right? If you're out in the world and you have an opportunity to, to choose the food for yourself, but this is food that's provided. Institutional nutrition, whether it's prisons, schools or hospitals, is literally food for people who cannot choose for themselves what they're eating. Mm. And yet we're here with a, a, an incredibly low budget and therefore, by definition, food that is going to be lower quality, less nutritious. What has been your experience talking to prisons about budgets mm. and any budget constraints on, on the quality? A lot of them don't know the budget. So we, we, uh, well, we often do kind of food forums. So we, because precisely what you said, you know, prisoners lack choice and kind of aut autonomy around their diets. So we often have food forums where we, we have we kind of have food reps per wing, basically. So we have um, an individual on each wing who kind of represent the, the views of their wing around food. So if there's something really good that they like, if there's something bad, etc. And the whole point is they, they should meet with the catering manager, the people actually cooking mm. the food. Um, and so some of those changes can be implemented. And the first one I ever did, it was really interesting because it just ended up being actually a really kind of positive conversation between the kitchen team and the people actually eating the food who rarely ever got the opportunity to talk, actually. Mm -hmm. um, unless you work in the kitchen, which none of these men did, you know, they, they didn't have that opportunity to talk. And actually, um, obviously the prisoners came in and they were like, the food's rubbish and you should be doing this, you should be doing that, the portions are tiny. And, and the catering team came in and said, look, we have £2.10 to spend, you know, we have these restrictions. And, and actually it was, it was really good because the men had no idea, you know, they didn't know what the government budget was. They didn't know what could be spent. Um, and it was really positive in that sense because we kind of ended it, I suppose, with a, with a you know, greater shared understanding. Um, but that doesn't, you know, if that hadn't have happened, then, you know, that, that kind of conversation wouldn't, have, wouldn't mm. have taken place, I suppose, yeah. What is the, what is the best way to improve the food in prisons? Big question. I always say there's, there's, there's two sides of it. I think from, from I guess, my experience, there's this uh, kind of big systematic changes, I suppose, which budget certainly is one of them. And I think someone the other day kind of did a calculation on the way inflation has risen over the years, and particularly mm. now, if we're you know, talking about cost of living and, and cost of ingredients. And he, you know, he said, basically, this is what the prison food budget should be, you know, and it was edging on three pound. Um, I mean, still, that's, you know, relatively low compared to the, you know, what, what you just said around the five pound. So, so certainly budgets, I suppose, is a huge thing. Prison kitchens, they work with one supplier. That's a centralised approach and that is national across the board. So you could go to a prison kitchen in the northeast of England. You could go to a prison kitchen in London and they're all accessing the same ingredients from the same supplier. Mm. You know, there are benefits to that. <laughs> I'm trying to be balanced here. <laughs> there are benefits to that. <laughs> The negatives of that is that uh, catering teams can't work kind of seasonally or um, locally, mm. um, ethically, you know, all of those things that we know are important in kind of good food and good diet. Um, and then I guess that the third big kind of systematic thing really is, is and Sophie, you, you touched on this, really is um, the logistics of prison and the environment. Mm. Um, and actually, if, if I'm being honest, I think that probably is, is the one that I see play out the most um yeah sometimes just the journey from the oven to the plate can be this long journey it can be hours long you know it can be sat on a hot trolley for 20 minutes it can be sat under a light for 10 minutes while everyone's getting unlocked and then it's gone cold mm. and that journey can have a much bigger impact on that plate of food because sometimes I see it coming out the oven and, and it looks all right and then I go down <laughs> to the wing and I'm like what? Mm. Um, so that journey has a real impact um, and then I guess the, the second side of things I guess more where we, we come in as a charity is there are changes that can be done I think there are improvements that can be made as it is at the moment um, in terms of getting more variety onto prison menus, um, healthier dishes, um, and just thinking a bit more creatively and, and thoughtfully most of the time, just thinking a little bit more about, yeah, who's eating that meal and, and what we can do to make it better. So there's certainly stuff that can be done as it is now, but I suppose thinking big um, for kind of true change to happen, I think, you know, those are the key things that, that would need to, yeah, change. Mm. Yeah. And so thinking big on a systematic and policy and campaign level, but thinking small on an individual cell level, what, Sophie, are the things that 
you have seen or have done yourself, seen prisoners do to improve the quality of the food that they're eating or the variety? What are the creative means of improving an in-cell diet? I mean, uh, prisoners are very, very resourceful. We've got lots of time to think about what we can do with things that maybe isn't their purpose. Um, so something that I did, and then it quickly cottoned on amongst other people in the prison, was um, I, we get canteen bags, so you can order tuck shop, basically. You get this once a week, and it comes in a big C3 plastic bag, and you get this normally on a Friday. And so we were keeping these bags aside. We managed to tap up some people in the gardens to fill up some little pots of compost for us. And then we were getting our very overripe tomatoes that came on our salads, popping the seeds out, sticking them a bit of kitchen roll, leaving the window to dry off, popping them in a plant pot, putting the plastic bag around them, and we were growing tomato plants in ourselves because that was the only way we could guarantee we were going to get anything fresh. The fruit that we got was never fresh. The only thing we could really do with it was, well... <laughs> make hooch. Make, make hooch. I'm not going to beat around beverages. this. Beverages. Yeah, um, yeah, we used to ferment Sorry, it. Sorry, so if you'd be honest. Yeah, we used to make hooch with the, the fruit because it was just way too overripe um, to be eating. So we would, you know, the, the only way we could really supplement our diet was by trying to grow stuff. And we were not allowed to do it, but prison also did turn a blind eye because we weren't harming anybody. Mm. Um, and then... On the open wing, we could request salad boxes. So a group of us got together, and one person would request chopped onions from the kitchen, one would request tomatoes, somebody else would request peppers, and we had a hot grill, uh, like a hot plate to make uh, toasted sandwiches with the sandwiches we were meant to be having for our lunches. And we would just use the hot grill to fry up all these bits of veggies that we got, and we just add them to noodles or chickpeas or whatever we had just to try and bulk it out and make it a bit more fresh mm -hmm. for us. Mm. There are lots of um, Instagram <laughs> accounts <laughs> of serving prisoners showing them what they're doing to supplement their own meals. So cooking food in kettles, trying to like washing off, um, you know, buying the cooked uh, chicken curry or something, yeah, really rinsing cool. it off and making something else with it to supplement the food that they're getting. And it, it strikes me, right, you you're in prison, you've managed to smuggle in an illegal phone, and the thing that you're most outraged by is the quality of the food, and that's what you're putting on your Instagram account. <laughs> like, it, it says something to me that that's the case, and um, just before, my little raised eyebrow about the, the contracting is, I think, as with so many of the services that have been privatised, um, in terms of our, 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 our public provision, I suspect very strongly but that one of the big considerations for the company who have received these lucrative government mm -hmm. contracts is the ability to make as much profit as possible from that government contract. And so as soon as you make a public service, a private uh, investment or a private endeavor, you automatically have a conflict between the need to provide for the people you're supposed to be looking after and your need to generate profit for your shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so I suspect that there is little incentive for the big contractor who has the contract for, and it's I think it's one contractor, has the contract for prison catering in the UK to spend more money because the more money spent on improving the quality of the nutrition in prisons is less money for the bottom line for shareholders. Mm. Cost, and my, cost and efficiency. My, you know, that's <laughs> my supposition. Does anybody have any thoughts or, or insight? Well, I get that? frustrated because um, part of what, what we do, and it was not, was not a strategy with the charity whatsoever, it was just I kept going to prisons and coming across unused or underused facilities. So whether that was um, a bakery in a prison kitchen, a butchery, we've just taken on a butchery, um, and a kitchen garden. Again, that, uh, all three of those, we're working with a bakery in, in a prison up north and, and, and the kitchen garden. And all three of those came about through complete chance. It was by me being in the prison and, and noticing that there were these incredible facilities uh, that were not fully being utilised. And, and above that, they provided employment 
employment and training for the people working in them. So it was a win-win. And actually, the more I looked into it, you know, 20 years ago, the, the prison system used to be pretty self-sufficient when it came to food. You mm -hmm. know, it wasn't a centralised contract. Um, and they were growing their own food and kind of, you know, sourcing their own meat and baking their own bread and, and things like that. And, and slowly that has gone. And, and it's worth noting that there are prisons that still do that, you know, uh, often the smaller prisons. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, it's something that we're trying to, to bring back in because often the facilities are there, you know. And I, we saw a bakery the other day in, in a prison. It was being used as a space to pack sandwiches, you know. <laughs> it's just like all this amazing equipment that, you know, I know bakers on the outside, I thought, you kill for this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was being used to kind of pack lunches. Um, but it's such, it's such a wasted opportunity, yeah. particularly in terms of, as you say, rehabilitation, skills training, giving people the skills that would help them to get into work, which would, we have some of the highest recidivism rates in Europe. More people come back, I think 70% within five years, come back to prison, they're re-arrested. And it's usually because there's very little to go out to or you've gone out with very little. Um, one of the things that in general nutrition, and I, I think and speak a lot about the importance of food as a way of coming together and companionship and um, how sharing food with someone is often a sign of trust. Mm. I'm, you know, I'm comfortable with you if I can eat in front of you, it's that kind of thing. Um, but in families, for example, we, we think about the importance of a communal table coming together, this shared space, because it's a time when your stress levels come down, you're less distracted, food helps you to feel calm, and you have an opportunity to speak and mm. commune and, and come together. And so that commensality is understood psychologically to be quite important in human psychology and sociality, but also just in, in well-being. And what you were saying early on, Sophie, about um, people being in their cells on their own a few yards from a toilet. From a... <sighs> Do you have any thoughts on the, the opportunity? What would it be like to have a shared table in a, in a prison dining hall, for example, on the end of a wing? I think it would be... I think it would be a very good thing for prison to do. If the only time you're interacting with other prisoners, other people that you're incarcerated with, is in a workplace where you're not allowed to talk or in an education setting where you're not allowed to talk, then there is no space for normal conversation to happen. And so maybe if you had a communal space, that would reduce prison violence because people are sitting down and chatting rather than mixed messages being spread or, mm -hmm. you know, window warrioring, we called it. So if you're a window warrior, you're shouting from window to window or passing notes on the line, swinging it down. Um, <laughs> So having that communal space, you'd have a much more open area for conversation. The meal becomes a shared experience. And maybe they don't want people eating together because they don't want a load of people being in the room saying, this food is shit. Mm. Because <laughs> you've got, you know, 40 angry people eating well, like, crap food. I think as well, it's so interesting what you say about how communal dining would be something that would reduce violence. And I agree with you on that, but the prison service would see it. They would see it. As something risk. that it would be, a, a, you know, a point in the day, 100 people together around a table. Well, that's, you know, a pinch point. And that's why communal dining doesn't exist in prison, because staffing, you know, there's no staffing to kind of facilitate that. I guess I'm thinking, because I, I worked in Holloway for a number of years, <laughs> some years. Um, and so at the end of the wing, it was at kind of end mm. of the wing, and there was a, a kind of, it was, again, an unused big space, had one sofa in it and a broken TV that never, nobody ever used. Um, it's where the, the breakfast packs were left in the morning mm -hmm. just for people to kind of maybe have a piece of toast or something. Um, and, you know, I can understand the safety risks and the safe, but there's also something about understanding that prisoners are people too and yeah. that when you show someone basic respect they're much more likely to respond to that mm. and we value being respected mm. and we're much more likely to kind of behave yeah. than if not I, I think going back to the purpose of prison prison in itself is punishment it's not there to give you further punishment once you're in prison and there are so many things within the prison system that are purely there to be punitive. You know, it's not about progression. And it, 
the lack of choice around food. So you choose your food two weeks in advance. So I don't know what I want to eat next Friday, but half of you don't know what you want to eat next Friday. But in prison, you have to know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's stripping everything away. And food just shows that so hugely, so vividly in prison of how much you don't have any control over anything. Mm. And yeah, it's just another way to punish people by not letting you sit with your peers to eat, mm. not having you, letting you have choice, giving you your breakfast pack the night before. You know, it's that kind of... I think it like, as well, it instills bad habits in people, and sometimes quite odd habits. Like, when I speak to people in prison, and the whole thing of lunch is served at half 11, dinner's served at half four, you know, you're eating at weird times, the food is served in a strange way, you're eating next to your toilet in your cell, and, and then all the other weird experiences of... A prison, you know, even the kettle cooking, you know, even people mm -hmm. opening a can with a pair of nail clippers, you know, none of it's normal. And yet you kind of expect someone to come out and then just go on and lead a normal life. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, some people have been in prison for a long time and they've been living like that. Um, fundamentally, you change as a person, you know, I don't think we can expect people to come out and have a great relationship with food and, um, you know, go back to kind of, you might not completely go back to communal dining or, I, I don't know, it's, um, I think you, you can pick up very odd habits that aren't, mm. isn't through no fault of your own, that, you know, aren't, aren't normal and, and don't encourage, you know, good relationship with, mm. with food, really. I think that's a really good point, that, that actually through food, and, you know, there are lots of other things we could be thinking about, but, you know, this is where we are. <laughs> um, but food would be an opportunity to help instill good habits in the prison environment. I remember um, when I was working, there was, um, it wasn't a client of mine, it was, I ran a, a team and someone was reporting back um, that someone had they'd never eaten at a table before. Yeah. And it was such a profound experience that they said, well, when I get out of prison, I'm going to buy a table and me and my daughter are going to eat at a table together. Mm. Um, and that was something that wouldn't have happened if not for prison, but that was a very particular setting at a very particular time. So there's an opportunity for prisons to help instill good habits that would be beneficial um, if we could be a bit, I think, more open and creative about it. I mean, prison is an opportunity. I think you've got, you've got a captive audience. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you kind of have, you know, you have a captive audience and, and that opportunity is being, being missed. And I think what you touched upon is, um, you know, there are lots of different types of people in prison and, and, I, and I hate to kind of blanket rule at all, but a lot of people in prison are coming in with an unhealthy relationship with food through whatever reason, upbringing, addiction issues, etc. cetera. Um, or they might just not, you know, healthy eating might not have played a big part of their, of their life before. And we're working in a young offenders prison at the moment, you know, 17, 18 year old men, and, and it's, they're not in, familiar with particular ingredients. And um, so it is an opportunity. And, and what's a shame is that they come in and then that almost kind of gets even worse because mm -hmm. there's not that opportunity to, to kind of build that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, you know, I kind of see that quite a lot, actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you know, young offenders and uh, earlier on we touched on aggression and violence. And I think some of you, if you follow me or listen to the podcast, you will have heard about the prison studies. And it's one of the things that I bang on about relentlessly. So I'll do it again here since I have <laughs> you here with me um, and for the audience at home. Um, but again, these studies demonstrate that food has an opportunity to improve conditions, not just for prisoners, but also for prison staff and for people on the outside once you know, prisons, prisoners are released. Um, but the prison studies are a series of randomized controlled trials. So what we consider the gold standard when looking at causality in clinical research. And they stretch back to 1997. So, you know, nearly 30 years. Um, and what's really interesting about the, what well, I call them the prison studies, but what's really interesting about them is that often when you do a clinical trial in a different location, you get quite different results. Mm. Um, you know, you might get a small effect over here, but a larger effect over there. And you have to make, you have to work out whether that's about the particular methodology you've used or the particular population you have, the particular expectations of the researchers. These studies are remarkable in the consistency of the effect that they, they demonstrate. And so in these four different locations, the US, the UK, the Netherlands and Singapore, um, improving nutritional status in this situation through supplementation um, so that you can do a placebo. You can't really placebo a, a whole meal often. Um, but improving nutritional status of prisoners through supplementation 
reduced objective incidents of violence by 30%. And what's really interesting about that, it's not just how remarkably uh, consistent that outcome is, but what's really remarkable about that is that if I were Kim Pharmaceuticals and I were going to the government or the FDA or NICE or whomever, and I said, I have a drug, I have a, a pill that is going to help to make your prison safer because they help people to manage their impulses, they make people less violent and they make them less aggressive and they do it by a whopping 30%. I would be a rich woman. <laughs> yeah, <you might. laughs> I would be off by myself in the Bahamas. So uh, we, <laughs> we know, we have, and, and, and we have clinical evidence. And in fact, if it were a drug, I would only need one or two trials demonstrating positive effect because you ignore the ones that show negative effect when you're putting a, a drug on the market. So we have an effective, cheap, accessible, low risk intervention, so the only side effects of nutrients is that you might get a bit healthier or, or nothing, um, intervention that could materially improve the well-being of offenders and prisoners, mm. the staffing, because violent prisons are not nice places for people to work and they tend to leave and there's a very high throughput and a very high turnover of staff and morale gets very low and then the qualified experienced people leave and the unqualified younger people come in and they can manage it very well and prisons become more dangerous as a consequence. Why do you think we're not doing it? Oh, that's hard to <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a little speculate. <laughs> what I mean... are your thoughts as to why whether it's through supplementation or improvements in the diet, the government isn't doing anything about this opportunity to improve outcomes. I think it's a thorny issue. And I think part of the reason I got involved in prison food is that I felt frustrated. Well, I came across the subject and I realized that no one was talking about it. And there was a lack of um, accurate information out there on, on what it was actually like to eat in prison. And there was certainly a lack of, of um, information that came from, from prisoners or ex-prisoners themselves. You know, mm -hmm. the information was, you know, from the media or from inspectors and things like that. And, and so, yeah, I started talking about prison food. And, and I guess that was me saying, well, that, that, you know, there's no voice here. You know, there's no one representing this issue. And, and the only reason I could imagine that no one was representing the issue is that... Um, not that people didn't care, but it existed. It existed. I mean, prison food doesn't touch most of our lives in the way that perhaps school or hospital food would, you know, other institutional settings. You know, we've all been to school um, or we have children that go to school. We might have been to hospital. We might have family been to hospital. So we almost have experiences of those other settings, whereas most people will never experience or know what the food is like in prison. And I think that makes it much easier for it to exist under the radar and for people to mm -hmm. ignore it, first and foremost. Um, and I, I guess the other reason is changing prison foods, I suppose what I've learned is um, a monumental task. Um, it's not as simple as just giving a few new recipes to the catering manager. You know, we're talking about changing a culture and a mindset and a way of doing things and educating a population um, and that, is a monumental task. It's not easy and it would take effort. I mean, supplementing would be a lot easier, but and I don't know. I, I, I don't I know. Ra people... I raise an eyebrow about the. <laughs> I, I think you're you're right, and I but I mm. raise an eyebrow at the monumental task bit because I think what COVID has demonstrated mm. to us is that where the government does have a sense of the urgency and the need we can implement policy okay. very quickly. Yeah. We can get things moving. We can mm. have people staying in their homes. We can change supply lines. We can you know, have vaccines distributed across the country. Where there's mm. will, there's a way. There's a way. Mm -hmm. Did you have any thoughts on <clears throat> that area? So? I think, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I know the answer, no, no. Um, I know that the, the media, perception of prisoners is not great and I think if they were to improve prison food which is definitely something that 100% needs to be happening I think the media backlash off the back of that because people have got no idea what the baseline is it's interesting you were saying it's £2.10 a day now when I was in prison in 2007-2010 
it was one pound ninety. Mm. So it's gone up twenty p essentially mm. in twelve to fifteen years. Mm. So people don't quite recognise what the baseline is. And as you were saying, you know, TVs in sales and playstations, well, yeah, they're babysitters basically. Mm. That reduces staff costs. So that has already caused you know enough uproar. Mm. Yeah. So by not having a publicised baseline of actually this is what prison food looks like. People will just be like, oh, they're giving prisoners more money. Why are they doing this? Mm -hmm. Because generally that is how the press treat prisoners. Mm. Mm. And the whole need of improving prison food, the whole message, I think, would just get lost, mm. unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. I think there's an argument to say that until public perception changes, prison food can't change. You know, it's something I've kind of um, said a few times, you know, said over the years, because it, it does feel like that a little bit. It feels like the risk might be too great for the government, you know, to, mm. and it all ends up in the Daily Mail. And I, I just, yeah, I don't know. It, it's very interesting. It, I, I think you're right. That, but it's the way that nobody cares about prisoners or prison food or the, the plight of prisoners until election time. <laughs> and suddenly when there's an election coming up in the next six months or so, mm. we're getting tough on crime, we're increasing prison sentences, we're making things safer for hardworking people. But for the rest of the time, there's absolutely no interest. And so there's this way in which, and I think about prison and prisoners as the unconscious of society. It's the place that we like to push the things that we don't like to think about. It's the place that we want to kind of uh, project all of our own, our own meanness and our worst qualities. At least I'm not like them. We kind of put it over there somewhere. And, and it allows us to forget about it and not think about it. Um, not think about prisons, not think about prisoners. And so, and I think the government and, and the media use this because it's a, it's a great kind of scarecrow to drag out every time there's an election to say, oh, here's these terrible people. Mm. Um, they're not like you, they wanna hurt you. Mm. And th that, what that means is that opin public opinion can't change yep. if it is in the service of politicians mm. for public opinion to stay mm. where it is. I think people don't realise that there's a huge variety of, of individuals in prison and, and I feel incredibly lucky to do the job I do every day because it's a very grounding experience really to go into a prison and realise actually I think anyone could end up here you know and, and there I do I meet a, a, such a variety of people um, for all sorts of reasons who have ended up in prison um, and there's no getting away from the fact that they have done something to receive that sentence but the way I see it is they're all in prison you know that that, that that's happened mm. you know and 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 they're here and it's not a case of lock the door and and forget about them it's like what what do we do with them now and I think for the for most of the public the journey ends when they're, they're they go to prison basically mm. I think and and that's kind of where the thinking hasn't really evolved I suppose um yeah over time mm. Mm. Uh, and I feel like my cynical side is really coming out. I'm really sorry. I'm usually very optimistic. Well, get the conspiracy theories. Uh, well, the, the, well the, the final thing is just that you know, uh, this, this. I think generally it's fair to say negative view that um, the public has of prisoners. Prisoners tend to be the people who get caught and can't afford to pay in a very expensive lawyer. You know, there are very prominent, wealthy, and royal people who have done quite serious yeah. crimes <laughs> but have managed to avoid having a day in court so um, yeah it's a big maybe we get back to the yeah <laughs> <laughs> um sophie what do you think would be the quickest easiest way a uh, thing to change if you understanding from the inside, the difficulty of, you know, getting food to prisoners, getting food that prisoners like, what would be an effective, best bang for your buck intervention, do you think? I think create your own ecosystem, if you like, in prison. Have prisoners growing vegetables, mm -hmm. chickens, laying eggs, because then the nutrition side is covered. You can get your protein from suppliers, you can get your chicken and, you know, your soy, your tofu, that kind of stuff. Get that from suppliers and have everything else coming in. It's seasonal, it's not going to be full of chemicals, it's not going to be treated with stuff to make it last longer in the fridge. And I think that's going to be the quickest way because prisons have got a lot of green space. 
Mm -hmm. It's not being used. Every prison I've been has got a massive gardens team, mm -hmm. massive greenhouses, and literally all they do is grow flowers. And the only reason they grow flowers is not for the prison to look nice for the prisoners, but for the prison to look nice for the people, the bigwigs who come round doing the prison inspections. Mm -hmm. It's not for us to enjoy. We don't sit outside. Mm -hmm. You don't get that opportunity. You don't get that, that freedom. So convert that space and make it into something to produce food and teach people the relationship with food. Because as you've mentioned, people have got no relationship with food. If you live in a chaotic life, food is not your focal point on the outside. So get them in prison, teach them, you know, growing food, where food comes from, like the life span of the food that you're eating. Mm. Make them healthier when they get out, they can continue that. Because people don't have these skills. And that would be the easiest way to improve the food for everybody in each prison. Mm. And then, you know, if you've got a wing or, you know, you know what people will eat, so you know how many people you've got, how many potatoes you need to be growing, you can control all that. And you can process food and freeze it, and then you've got it in the kitchens ready. Mm. I think that would be the easiest way. Do you think, because Holloway used to have award-winning gardens, you're absolutely right, and flowers, beautiful flowers. And I think towards the end of my time there, they had chickens. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were called the jailbirds. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, it strikes me that people would be very keen to learn how to grow vegetables and grow food and take care. I mean, the, it was considered a privilege to be able to look after chickens and, and people were very, very keen to kind of get onto that course. Do you think switching from flowers to, be, to food would be a popular option? I think so, because there's something in it for the prisoners then. Because it, there's nothing in it growing flowers. They don't go back to your cell, you don't sit in a vase because you can't have vases. I think it would, I think it would <laughs> make a massive difference. <laughs> Mm. I think anything to do with food in, in prison yeah. is so popular as well, isn't it? Yeah. Any, any opportunity to get stuck in um, in a kitchen or yeah. And it gives you ownership, but you have yeah. ownership of nothing. Everything is out of your control in prison. Like even basics, like having to go and ask for toilet roll. You ask your wing officer, I need some more loo roll. You don't have control over anything. So being able to have control over something and have an ownership of something would be so powerful. Mm. And you're giving that person back a little bit of humanity. Mm. And just having that would be amazing. But I think, thank you, that, that's really lovely. And I, I know you're a keen allotmenter as well. Is that, is that the right phrase? Yeah. Um, uh, but as you're talking, it just strikes me that that thing, even when you're growing kind of a little crest, even in school, I remember you put crest in a little eggshell and you've got a little crest head. Um, but being able to see that progression and having a a direct contact with something that is growing and living and thriving and you are taking care of and tending can be deeply soothing as well, I think. I mean, tell me about your allotment and what you get from it. So I've got an allotment. <laughs> it's not just an allotment, Sophie, is it? <laughs> More than that. Yeah, here's my, my space. No, um, so I've got an allotment and for me, being able to go and put stuff in the ground and grow it is amazing. My yeah, kitchen table at home currently is full of broad beans and tomatoes and all sorts of stuff wow. that, that's getting ready to go outside. And it's just having that relationship with nature, which is something you don't have in prison because you spend forever indoors. I mean, you probably walk a thousand steps a day if you're lucky. So actually being able to be outside, getting the microbes in the soil, being hands on because you're not hands on with anything in prison. You, mm -hmm. That isn't something and in it, an allotment or just generally having a garden and having that outside space that you can potter in does massively quiet the mind. And in prison, you've got nowhere quieting the mind. Mm -hmm. You can't really do hobbies in your, your cell easily because you can't get the stuff in to do it. And so I think having that space is, is really important. And for me, my allotment is a place for my friends to come, a place for my nieces to come with me. And then we just cook stuff up that we've grown and we grow weird stuff. and. <laughs> I flavour gin and I make wine and so I've got my own little like self-sufficiency going on just from having the allotment mm -hmm. which was never the planned outcome but that's what has happened from it. Mm -hmm. So nice. 
Lucy, have you seen with your projects an impact on the mental health of the people or the well-being? Of the yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the kitchen garden is one. I mean, even when you were just chatting then, I was thinking, because we're, we're about to bring in some, some bees to prison, which I was a bit... <laughs> I was a bit sceptical about before. I thought it was going to be a health and safety uh, red tape nightmare, but apparently not. Um, and, and also, I didn't know how it was going to go. Again, this is the Young Offenders Prison. I thought, how is this going to be popular? Mm -hmm. And honestly, like, they're so excited because I think it's just caring for something. I know it's a big, but <laughs> caring for something and, and tending to it and seeing a result at the end of it. You know, I think for them, the idea of getting honey at the end of it is... Mm. is the exciting part of it so I think that journey particularly um and, and yeah mental health wise and that kind of the therapy that you get from that so I would say our kitchen garden project 100% is it's a no-brainer you know and, and some people who are working on the grounds there you know you speak to them and they're like they're just doing it for a job to get out of their cell and in my opinion that is a 100% legitimate excuse to, to do that job you know you don't have to want to be a gardener but you know working five days a week out kind of on the on the grounds I think um is hugely beneficial um and then, yeah, I suppose with, with our other projects, I mean, we, we, we do some food education, but we've also kind of introduced some new recipes onto menus at um, a, a prison, uh, a men's prison up north, um, which has been really interesting. And, and it's been a really interesting kind of um, process for us to understand. Um, yeah, it's the first time we've actually put our own dishes onto the menu. And it's been a really interesting process of looking at what people are picking. Um, What's, can you give an example of what you Yeah, about? well, we went quite... Um, Nat, my development chef, she's amazing in the audience, and she, she did all the recipes. And um, both her and I, because it was the first time we were doing it, went quite ambitious. You know, we did 60% kind of plant-based recipes and um, had some amazing stuff on there and, and using different ingredients. And actually, when we were looking at it, and it, there's five choices a day. So, I mean, you have our choice, and then you might have a chicken curry and lasagna and things like that. And actually... If our choice, if our gorgeous Brazilian feijoada with salsa <laughs> was next to a chicken curry and lasagna, it would get eclipsed by the chicken curry or the lasagna. And I thought it's really been a good process in, in thinking about um, what do people want from prison food? And, and it's much more than it just being a source of nutrition, I think. And it's that comfort element and that familiarity and... and we're doing another kind of cycle of recipes at the moment and we've, we've changed tack slightly. Um, I mean, we have had some really popular dishes and particularly with the vegetarians and vegans who are often a really, um, they often get a bit of a, a bad time of it on the prison menus, to be honest, because mm -hmm. the vegan options are a little uninspiring. Um, so it's been great for that, but I think we've, we've changed tack slightly and, and started thinking about food in a more kind of emotional way and, and the mental health benefits of it, I suppose. Um, and, you know, on a Friday, people do want a chicken curry you know I certainly do and um just thinking about it in a slightly different way I suppose um so yeah and yeah I think food education and, and like you say any opportunity to kind of get stuck in with food in, in prison is is hugely popular it's a release I think um you know and even just working with different ingredients I mean we did a, a baking project in a, in a prison at Christmas and um we kind of got in some we managed to get some amazing donations and ingredients and work with some incredible suppliers and local suppliers and even just working with like some beautiful cheese you know and everyone just went mad they were like real cheese you know they're <laughs> real cheese <laughs> and um yeah I think even just that it can create a really lasting impact on mm. someone within that environment you know mm. yeah because we remember food experiences yeah. we remember them they sit I mean they literally become part of us and you, you spoke about the idea of the, the young offenders caring for the bees and it brought to mind the idea of care. Mm. Um, and kind of colloquially, we're all well versed with the idea that we often show people that we care through food, you know, whether we're cooking for you or whether it's a comfort food, whether I've made you a bowl of soup when you're ill. We understand that through food conveys something else. Food has meaning. It says something about how I feel about you. Mm. Um, you know, if I, will I give you my last Rolo, that kind of thing. Right? <laughs> um, and, and so it always, that always makes me think about the meaning that is received when a prisoner gets handed a kind of congealed, cold, yeah. uncared for meal at the end of the day. You know, does it, does it, feel like a slap in the face does it really feel like actually 
nobody no really cares, cares about, about you. Mm. Yeah. Any thoughts, Sophie? There were, there were certain foods that everybody ate, and normally it was the foods that were cooked by the foreign national prisoners because mm. food within their community was a communal thing. So the curries we had cooked by a lady called Mrs Patel. I remember her name because her food was amazing. Um, so there are really strong memories around decent food, but getting that cold, congealed mess, beige, burnt, boring, on a daily basis, it, you just, it just strips away anything. You're just eating purely because you need to put food in your body and out of boredom, not because you want to be doing it. I think it almost makes the subject of prison food a bit more complicated because an example is um, we work with Brixton Prison and, and the catering manager there, Felix, he's um, a legend, best catering manager in the country. He's actually just been shortlisted for the best cater uh, catering manager of the year award. Congratulations, um, Felix. Yeah. And, and Brixton's been kind of voted, if you look at the prisoner surveys, it comes out top in terms of food um, satisfaction. And, and when I first, first met Felix years ago, I was like, okay, right, what is this guy doing that's different? And, and it felt different, you know, his kitchen felt different. It was such a kind of positive environment. There was a huge amount of respect. The men were treated very professionally. It was seen as, you know, it was like a restaurant kitchen, basically. And actually, when you read his menu, it didn't look that dissimilar to another prison menu. Um, some dishes I saw were, you know, a little bit more interesting and vari uh, varied, but a lot of it seemed quite similar. But actually, the, the end product was very, very, very different. And it was honestly just down to a catering manager who cared very deeply about that plate of food and about the people eating it. Um, and he shows that care and, and love kind of every day, really. And I know, it's emotional. And, um, and, and that was the difference to me. And I, in a sense, it makes things harder. It certainly makes our job harder because I look at someone like Felix and I was like, OK, how can we bottle you mm. <laughs> and put you here and actually... I don't think you can do that because I think um, that's him as a person. You know, he that is just who he is mm. and how he kind of shows his like love and respect. But my God, you know, it really does show in that end plate of food. And, and actually, if you speak to anyone at Brixton, they are very positive about the foods, um, especially people who've been to other prisons. You know, they can really mm -hmm. see the difference. Um, yeah. What do you, what have you found is the most frustrating barrier in any part of your conversation about improving prison food? Yeah, I think um, I get told a lot that prisoners only want junk food, um, and that really annoys me. <laughs> um, I think there's a, and it's really difficult because, um, again, when I was at Brixton the other week, I was making everyone in my little group a cup of tea in the morning, and they were like, right, nine sugars, four sugars. I was like, you guys have so much sugar. You just cut down your sugar. So on the one hand, I understand there are people in prison with a poor relationship with diet. I don't think prison helps that, you know. Um, but on the other hand, you can't, you know, you can't tarnish everyone with the, with the same brush. And yeah, I've been told that so many times over the years, you know, it comes from the public, it comes from people within the system. Um, and for me, that's a problem because if you think that everyone in this system only wants bad food, you're only going to kind of give them bad food. I suppose you're not going to do anything to improve that. And, and personally, my experiences have been not that people want bad food. It's that they might have never experienced um, healthier food or different ingredients. And actually, the minute you add some context and educate them and introduce them to it, of course, you know, they want it. Of course they want to try it. It's just that they haven't before, you know. Mm. Um, so that frustrates me. And I, I do think it kind of holds things back sometimes, that, that mindset, I think, mm. yeah. Have you encountered that you're nodding along? So if I wanted to be no, I'm just, I'm just, Yeah, just agreeing with what Lucy was saying there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's very frustrating. What has been, because I know you, not necessarily around food, but you do work in prisons around restorative justice. Mm -hmm. What has been for you the most frustrating encounter either when you talk about your work or when you're trying to get back into prisons and, and meet with people what do you come up against I mean I've had it I've, <laughs> I've, I've had it quite easy getting back into prisons um the the prison governor of HMP Downsview said to me the gate's always open and I thought it would have been nice if you told me that 12 years ago <laughs> um you know but uh yeah so I've been I've been very fortunate, but the thing that I find so frustrating is the lack of progression. Mm. 
everything is still the same mm. as it was all those years ago. And it's almost like stepping back into that. I mean, the only difference is now is there's mobile phones in prison, which there wasn't, and Instagram exists. So you can now find out more about prison. <laughs> um, so there's more connection to the outside world, to the inside world, not always positive, but that's, that's there. Mm -hmm. But it's the wasted space. HMP Downview has got an AstroTurf pitch. You're not allowed to use it as a prisoner. It's just for staff. Mm. You've got an entire pitch here. If you want people to be healthy, you need to be making them exercise. You can't go to the gym if you've been in trouble. It's mm -hmm. these things, again, it, it's still more punitive measures. Um, and just that mm. whole exercise, healthy eating, the whole mindset needs to massively shift. So the stuff that actually we're told is a basic health needs that we should all be doing every day are in some cases used as privileges. If you're naughty, you can't go down to the gym, you can't get any yeah. exercise. Whereas if you're naughty, you've probably got some undiagnosed mental health conditions so doing something in the gym or exercising or eating healthily would control that behaviour. Yeah, I think that's a good point because it's something I see a lot and, and the, the naughtiest people often are the people who, who leave the wing the least, basically. So they have the least access to education fresh air and, and they're yeah. probably the people that need it the most um and they are the people that you know just get worse you know the environment just kind of makes them worse and takes its toll on them um and that's really frustrating completely backward mm -hmm. <laughs> i think as well on top of that you're right prisons move incredibly slow and covid i think has has pushed oh, things backwards oh. mm -hmm. um and i think we're, we're coming out of that and i think there's some, there's some good stuff going on but also there's a an acceptance of, uh, I guess, a new regime. And, and during COVID, um, you know, just to let you know, it's kind of 23-hour bang-up kind of across across the prison estate and, and less time out of cell, less less association time. And, and that meant that violence kind of went down because people are getting together less, but mental health is now at, at kind of record levels in, in prison. Um, but it's very difficult. It's like you said, if prison, if violence has gone down in prisons, the staff are like, yay. <laughs> violence has gone down, but self-harm has gone exactly. up exponentially. Um, but because the violence has gone down, there's a reluctance to kind of fully open up again because, and there's a lot of staff that have started during COVID who don't know what the prison system was like before um, when there was kind of free flow and association and, and things like that. Um, so are the regimes still on lockdown? At the no, so they've, they've gone, they've been kind of, there's different stages and they're, they're slowly going back to normal. Sorry, I feel the need to, no. that is, that wasn't my terminology. That's yeah. the terminology in prison is regime. Yeah. So, um, not timetable, um, yeah. but regime, sorry. They are slowly going back to normal and it's different at each prison. And, and if there is an outbreak, you know, it's, it kind of might go back for a bit and then, but yeah, things have opened up. Um, but yeah, in, sometimes in a bit of a reduced way, yeah. Okay, so let's flip that question <laughs> um, because we're getting towards the end of our, our kind of main time. And what are the things that make you hopeful? What are the signs of optimism? What, what makes it worth going in? Well, for me, you know, the main sign of optimism is the Food Behind Bars project, first off, Aww. because that is such a massive step. I mean, we talk about food a lot, <laughs> generally in life, but in terms of prison it's just such a huge huge step and seeing more charities having access I mean there are cuts across the board in prison like arts creative stuff not happening mm. there's no funding for it anymore there's no money coming in for it so seeing the ability to ch for charities to adapt to what's going on and provide stuff that the prisons are not providing because they can't you know prison governors want to do more than what they are doing but their hands are tied they've got more red tape than anybody else to navigate. So things for hope for me are definitely the fact that more charities have more of an impact in prisons, more of a footprint that's lasting longer so when the charities step back, these activities can still continue in a different way. Um, and I see this when I go in, I find out about new charities that are set up, new charities run different courses in the prison, and that can only benefit the people in there. Mm. And they're not coming at it from the wrong agenda, they're doing it from the right place and that's the best place to start and for you well i'm an eternal optimist <laughs> even some say, some some days it's hard but um i yeah i think as 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 awful in a place prison is there are pockets of, of joy and that's kind of why i continue doing what i'm doing because i do see those kind of pockets of, of joy i suppose i mean from, from my perspective i think um particularly since setting up the charity 
you know, the, the response from prisons, you know, and, and not just the prisoners. Obviously, the prisoners want better foods. So we, yeah, we get a good response there. But I mean, from the, you know, decision makers and the prison staff, particularly governors, you know, who often are very forward thinking and, and do want the best for their prison. Um, you know, there's a demand there and people want this. And for me, that's hugely positive. It was kind of why I, you know, set up the charities because I I felt that there was a demand. And actually, over the years, that's kind of only got got greater. So I think people want this. And I think for me, that's that's what keeps me going. Um, and and yeah, the optimism, I think, for me comes from yeah working with the people that we work with, really, and and seeing an impact and, and seeing that need and, and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and as I say, I think the final thing to add, and Felix is a great example of that, every prison is very different and there's problems across the board, but there's also kind of amazing greatness happening across the board as well. And um, whenever I come across something like that in prison, I'm like, yeah. And also as well, it makes you realise that it can be done. You know, it, I think it, it can be done. Good food can be served. You know, we can have great gardens. We can do this. Um, if it's being done in one place, it can be done elsewhere, in my opinion. So yeah, I, I think that note of optimism is. I had a particularly <laughs> difficult time in prison, so maybe <laughs> yeah. my difficulty with the particular you're just, that you're I, scarred was, by I'm it. Just, <laughs> um, so that's a, a very helpful balancing point. Mm. Um, I wondered. So I did say that this was going to be a lovely, cosy chat, but also political manifesto. Um, is there something that you would... We have an audience here. We've got 300 people at home. Maybe this will get out even further. We don't know who's watching. But is there something, either a myth you would like to dispel or a fact that you would like people to know, a truth that you would like people to understand mm. about the work that you do or your experience in this area? Mm. Well, I mean, <laughs> I was just going to say... I didn't prep them. No, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll give you a moment. I think mine's, to be honest, it's, it almost goes back to the prisoners wanting junk food thing and, like, and, and also the, the kind of prisoners are bad people narrative as well, which, um, you know, I understand is a difficult one for some people to get their head around, you know. Um, I think we have a, quite a black and white view in this country of, of good and bads, whereas um, for me, it, you know, it's a lot more complicated than that. And... Um, and I think it would be worth people understanding that a little bit more. And, and obviously, I'm lucky, you know, I, I, I get to go into prisons. And so that comes, I see that, you know, and I, it's very difficult for the public when, you know, we have a mainstream media that, that does kind of encourage that narrative, you know, of, of good and bad. Um, so I, I, I think it is hard for the public to kind of, yeah, mm. I don't know, not get my point across, <laughs> across possibly, but you, you know what I mean, mm. I think. It's just understanding, it's yeah, just having some understanding and, and some em empathy about other people's situations, I suppose, is, is, yeah, where I'm coming from, I think. Yeah, I often think, we like to think that we're where we are through our own kind of tenacity and intellect and hard work, but it's very, when you hear people's stories, it's very much there by the grace of God go I. It's, yeah. You got lucky m very often, or you were born to the right parents, or you were born in the right place, or you got in with the right group of friends, that meant you didn't go down a different path. We like to assume that mm. we would never make these choices. Yes. But I think yeah. we're much closer. To I think so. And I think as well, I mean, the final thing is that, you know, every single one of these people is going to come out of society, you know. And, and I remember when I first started this, I spoke to a prison governor, and he was amazing, and he kind of just put it in context to me. It's like these people are going to come out, they're going to live in in our communities, they could be your neighbour, you know, what kind of state do you want them to be in um, when they come out? And if you want them to come out and live a kind of law-abiding life and a healthy life, um, what do we need to do while they're in prison to make sure of that, you know? And I, I think we lose sight of that journey a little bit um, in mm. everyday life, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think mine's just going to hark back to the, the imprisonment itself as a punishment. There doesn't need to be further deprivation of liberties when you're in prison. And as Lucy said, if you want people to be well-rounded members of society going back into society, you've got to give them that skill set in prison. You've got the best opportunity, the best time to give people a routine where they're going to bed at a normal time and getting up at a normal time and having a day filled with meaningful activity. Two hours in the morning of doing something, two hour bang up over lunch and two hours of something in the afternoon, that is not a normal routine. And so we need to fill that time more effectively, get more stuff happening within prisons to give people the knowledge they need when they get out they can just settle into society as a normal person because mm -hmm. not everyone will have the opportunity to be an open prisoner and get used to that routine before they're released mm -hmm. quite often people will just be 
you know, there you go, 50 quid in the bus pass or travel card, you're on your way. Mm -hmm. And they've not learned anything in prison, I think particularly over COVID. It, mm -hmm. It's just been really difficult, full stop, for prisoners to be, you know, given any, any information sure. and any support at all. So you've got a captive audience in prison, make it work. It's more cost effective, you know, speculate to accumulate. Mm. Spend the money now, you're not going to be spending it on multiple court, court On re-arresting people. Re-arresting <laughs> people, taking up spaces in, you know, police cells, accessing mental health units in the community. You can, you know, stop that mm. in prison so that that's not going to happen again for that person. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Lucy. Thank all of you for listening. I'm now going to open up the floor for some questions. I do have one note on that, which is we do have an audience at home. Um, so please wait for the mic to arrive, because if you start speaking, the people at home can't hear the question. So that is the only thing, but happy to take your questions. Um, go wild. This lady here. Um, hi, so um, thank you for the talk and um, please excuse my ignorance. I've got two questions and uh, maybe one for Sophie and one for Lucy if I may. One is the social aspect of it. Um, what happens, uh, do you guys get um, kind of um, meals around like celebration times and how does that work on the, on the gap? Like do you get to sit around the table at those times? And the second one is, um, um, can you speak a little bit more about the disjuncture between the training courses and feeding the, 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 um, yeah, the, the prisoner population? How, how, come, how come it doesn't hmm. join up? Good question. So if I take the, you go, you go I'll up. take the celebration um, yeah. question. So interestingly in prison, quite a lot of people change religion because the food is better um, during Ramadan because it just is. But again, I remember seeing women running across and getting their kettle pots of food and going straight back to their cell. So there is no celebrations that happen like that. Christmas dinner in your cell. You get a bar of chocolate, though, from the chaplaincy team, which is amazing. But again, you're, the f you're given the food. There is no communal eating around that time. Normally, because it, any religious celebration is normally spent with your family with your community, with your peers. So it's a very emotional time for a lot of people. So again, emotions can be quite heightened, not always in the best way. So I think that's, again, just a safety aspect of, no, you can't celebrate this. I mean, New Year's Eve is great. We're all running around with toilet paper, chucking it over the, the landings <laughs> and stuff. But actual sitting down for meals doesn't happen. Because one of the things that as a therapeutic team we understood very well was that and it, it seems strange when you when the outside of it but um the points of highest anxiety and distress in prison are christmas mother's day or in the women's prison mother's day um birthdays anniversaries times when people are acutely feeling the separation from their the people you know that know them um and the people who perhaps they feel cared about them the most. And so I, I wonder if, uh, maybe even if you, if you couldn't have a communal meal, maybe just a better meal, you know, like a proper Christmas dinner. Yeah. yeah. And one, I, I wonder what that would do. Think. But, no, well, I was just thinking, because we did this um, for precisely that reason, because Christmas in particular can be a very isolating time in, in prison. And, and also it's a trigger point for, for mental health and, and, and violence as well. And we did a, a, a baking project at, at Christmas in the bakery at one of the prisons where we're working at. And I mean, logistically, it was an absolute nightmare. But we were 850 men in the prison and we, we created a, a little bakery box for each of them that was distributed the week before Christmas. So we had the men making um, three baked goods so whatever three times by 850 was that was how many products we made and um that was when we got the real cheese in and yeah we just gave them a little and it had a note on it and said you know happy christmas and it was something quite small but actually the feedback that we got that it was actually a big deal you know that, that it was um and actually even like a gift you know i think like you don't get christmas gifts you know so i think even just having something that you can open you know that was a something for yourself yeah um 
so in answer to your second question, <laughs> um, I guess so, yeah, so, so we do education and training, like you said, and, and I suppose we, we do some work as well with prison kitchens and catering managers around getting new stuff on the menu. We will always try our best to link the two together. So, I mean, the kitchen garden, everything that we're growing um, is going to the prison kitchen and we're kind of helping support the prison kitchen in, in utilising some of those ingredients because that's quite a new way of working for them, not at all prisons, but this particular one. The bakery as well, I mean, as I say, we're, we're running a bakery training course, but the bakery is within the prison kitchen, so a lot of the stuff they're working on is being served on the menus, and we want to kind of push that further. Um, but I guess that the kind of missing link for me, and, and something that we're, we're developing more as a charity, and, and I suppose something that, particularly in the last year, I've realised um, there's a real need for, is actually food education in a really holistic sense. So it's it's not about training someone to go and work in hospitality. It's actually about um, all of those food habits and, and, and stuff that I, t I spoke about. And um, that kind of education, in my opinion, needs to be accessed by every single person in the prison. And I think if we're going to get people picking the healthier option on the menu, for example, or changing their eating habits, there needs to be a huge amount of work done on educating those people as to why they might want to pick that. Um, and that's really difficult. I mean, even just getting 10 people in a room together in prison is it's really difficult. Um, so it's something that we're trying to factor into our work and particularly now COVID's kind of, yes, coming to a, a relative end. Um, it's something that we, we think is integral because actually I think there's two sides of changing prison food. Yes, there's improving the actual food, but I think that's only half the story really. Um, and that's been a learning of mine, I suppose, um, and something that we're yeah trying to factor into our work. I hope that answers your question. Anyone? Well, is that one from online? Yeah, we'll take one from Lisa and we'll come. Um, I'm a GP working. Um, the, this is from um, someone who I think is called Helly. Um, I'm a GP working in a Scottish prison. I was told that the healthiest item on the menu was a pie. I spend a lot of time in GP consultations advising my patients to lose weight, get more exercise. Most of my patients have mood, addiction and musculoskeletal skeletal complaints. We know that nutrition is central to these conditions. Has there ever been a survey of prison population, staff or governors on this subject? Not that I'm aware of. There's surveys that go out to prisoners and they're often done around inspection times um, in terms of like, <laughs> they are, <laughs> food satisfaction. Um, there are some fantastic prisons who do do that kind of consultation regularly. That question really touches upon a subject that um, I totally get the frustration. Healthcare is a kind of, kind of an in, you, know, you would know, an independent kind of, yeah, part of the prison, but kind of independent. And it's really frustrating that there are dietitians who work in prison, you know, and I've been in touch with them before. And it's really frustrating for them to sit down with their patients, the prisoners, and say, you need to be having five portions of fruit and veg per day. You need to be going... And then that prisoner saying, well, I can't. And it, 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 honestly, it's, and I don't know, you know, it, uh, yeah, it's so difficult. And, um, you know, I even had a prisoner um, who had diabetes and, yeah, he was being told to kind of eat certain things and not eat certain things. And, and yet he couldn't have access to those things. And, and there's a real mismatch there, I think. Um, uh, so I feel for, for her um, because I see I do see that happening quite a bit, actually, and healthcare have a very difficult job in that sense because they're trying to give healthy advice that actually is not can't something... Can't they, they can't implement it, yeah. Um, mm. So I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's but a big challenge, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't think so, seems to be the answer. Um, this lady here, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's just a question about the budget point. So I guess that's probably one of the key drivers of that centralised supply chain as well, is just for cost and efficiency. Um, so sort of who do you think is responsible for driving change in that £2.10? Should that come from... I know governors have uh, a little bit of autonomy to supplement that, so should catering managers sort of be lobbying governors or should governors be feeding that back to HMPPS and yeah. MOJ? Like... What's that sort of feedback loop to make that change? Yeah, yeah. so it's a good good point, actually, and good to explain how the, the budgets work because governors do have autonomy, and that wasn't always the case. So a governor in the prison manages their budgets across the, the prison, and, and food comes under that. So they do have the autonomy to 
to set those budgets. As I say, as far as I know at the moment, the average seems to be coming in at £2.11. I'm expecting that to go up because of where food prices are at at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not saying they have more money to spend, but I'm expecting there to kind of be an overspend in that sense. Um, and, and, and that system can work and it cannot work. So if you have a governor who really values the food in that prison, they, as I say, they, they can top it up. Um, and we've seen really good examples of that. If they don't, um, it can drop under that £2 limit, you know, and they can kind of detract from that. I suppose that the budgets, in a sense, even though the governments have, the governors have relative autonomy, you know, within reason, really that has to come from the top, you know, the, the decision makers at the top, the Ministry of Justice, the, the Justice Minister um, government, I think any kind of increase in that um, would have to come from, from the decision makers at, at the top, I suppose. Um, yeah. Um, let's, I've been focusing on this side of the room, just this, this lady <laughs> here, to get some balance, and then we'll come to you. Um, so from what I understand as well in like the US too, prisoners also eat at really weird times. <laughs> Why? Like what, what's the mentality behind So that? staff can take their lunch on time <laughs> and they can have dinner and it's to do with yeah. the shift changeovers for staff. Um, it depends what their rotors are, and it's just easier to do it that way. It's it's a it's a prison myth actually. It's a good prison myth, not a prison myth, but a truth about prison. And and again, before I started working there, I had no idea how things work. But there is a regime, and typically that regime involves being unlocked perhaps at half past eight ish to attend kind of education, for example, be coming back onto the wing for eleven fifteen, half eleven. Lunch is served at half past eleven. Um, and then educational work doesn't commence again until 2 p.m. Um, and then they come back to the wing at four o'clock. Um, and it, it is for that reason, Sophie obviously knows, you know, that the prisoners have their lunch and then the staff have their lunch. So um, obviously when prisoners have lunch, it requires a relative amount of staff resource, you know, in terms of actually unlocking them and facilitating that. And then, yeah, the, the, the staff have kind of their lunch break as well. So that tends to be why there's that gap in the day. Um, again, it's frustrating because, um, I mean, it's frustrating for us actually as an education provider, because we always have a weird gap in the middle of the day <laughs> um, and also quite short sessions. And also if you're trying to get someone kind of work ready, I suppose, for me, that isn't how the, well, I don't know, maybe some of your working days work <laughs> like that, good for you if so. <laughs> but um, most of us don't have a two and a half hour break in the middle of the day, yeah. <laughs> Um, are you aware of any positive initiatives or models from other countries that we could learn from mm. in the UK? Scandinavia. I mean, you've been to different countries and been to prisons in other countries, haven't you? Yeah, well, but, yeah. I but think not good ones. <laughs> <laughs> there are some countries that have got imprisonment spot on in terms of the activities that people do within the prison setting. And those prisons where the men and women cater for themselves they have the budget and they're told what the meal is going to cook for the wing this week. And they do the shopping, get it in, and they cook that way. It tends to be in countries where the risk of violence is much lower. So the prisoners going to prison for violent offences is lower because as a nation, it's a less violent country. Um, so that wouldn't always work. Yeah, yeah, I think second to that, from my experience and from what I've kind of seen and, and read in the statistics, I suppose, the most successful examples are that uh, the self-catering examples. Um, and that's where you have a kitchenette on the wing, for example, and yeah, you all pal together and, and, and that works, you know, for obvious reasons, because um, you have that choice, you work together, you can eat when you like, etc. cetera. So, um, and they tend to be in Scandinavian countries and, and Scandinavian countries have the kind of, um, yeah, lowest reoffending rates in Europe and we have the highest reoffending rates in Europe. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you do the maths. <laughs> <laughs> Italy has one of the, apparently the best well catered. Well, I heard that in Italy you get a glass of wine at lunch, but <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think that was from a reputable source. Um, yeah. Maybe that's why they sleep for two hours. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sounds very Italian. Um, do you want to do another one? Yeah, from there are, there are more. Um, uh, right, okay, so 
Um, yeah, thank you. A lot of people say thank you for the, for the great talk. Um, I'm a medical student working, on in, working in inclusion health. I was wondering how you overcome the difficulty of trying to affect positive change for a population whose suffering is almost necessary, necessary for society to feel comfortable or better about themselves. Yeah. Oh, Gosh, that's very deep. From Jen. Yeah. yeah, well, I think it kind of goes back to the way we see prisoners, I suppose. And yeah, I mean, it feels quite sad thinking that, that that's a necessary part of society, I suppose, because um, does it have to be? You know, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think in terms of generating positive change, and like I said, I think public perception and, and the way we see prisoners is, is probably our our biggest barrier. I mean, we had this conversation actually in, in the room before, and I have felt as though, particularly during COVID, there's been an increased empathy or understanding of perhaps what it might be like uh, being locked away. Certainly as a charity, we felt, um, yeah, an increase in support, I think, and, and just understanding. Um, I think me personally as well, when I first started kind of campaigning for an improvement in prison food about six years ago, and um, I was, yeah, I was 24 and, and, and I was doing it by myself. And I think um, that was when I got loads of com awful comments, you know, not about prisoners only deserve dog food and terrible things. And, um, but I think when it was just me, I think almost I was more of a target, whereas we've been a charity now for two years and that has eased off a little bit slightly <laughs> because, yeah, um, I'm not saying you can't troll a charity, you probably could, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe it still exists, but I just don't kind of feel it as much, I suppose, or, or witness it. I think, I, I think it's kind of, extend the analogy that the, the way in which we we make it less necessary to have this function of the unconscious expressed through prisons is, is through more visibility you know this is yeah. what we do in a therapeutic sense is like we take that stuff that you don't want to talk about admit to yourself or or even tell someone else and we bring it to light so we can see what it's really about and is it as scary as you think it is um, sometimes it is, but often not. And I think it's the same thing. I think more visibility for prisoners and former offenders so that we can understand that they're not kind of ogres with red eyes who are out mm. to, you know, steal your dreams, that they're people who have had certain experiences and are trying to get their lives back. I think would be very helpful. Um, that doesn't kind of directly answer the question, but I think that's a necessary part of the process, which is making all aspects of human life and human experience more visible and open for conversation and communing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, gentle. Oh, sorry. No. It's okay. It was more of a comment about. Um, um, prisons in other countries that are doing it well, and it seems like there's a very clear link between countries have good social welfare versus what prisons like, the autonomy. Mm -hmm. And I did study criminology for four years, so in terms of like my public percep or perception in the public or whatever, like I do, I don't think prisons should exist yeah. <laughs> for the most part. Um, they're expensive, and I think the public forget that all the time. And did I have a question? Probably. <laughs> but that, no, that's a lovely Comments comment. We'll take, we'll take that. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right that actually, if you have a society that is the more unequal a society, the more violence you have, the more crime you have, the more abuse you experience. And then you put those people into prison and expect that the prison system is somehow going to make it better. It doesn't make sense. Someone needs to make it make sense. Um, so, and, and yeah, conversely, when people grow up with a sense of social security, where a sense that the government cares about them, a sense that they might have a future, they think that their lives and their incomes and their rent is secure and they don't have to fight every day for their dignity, you're going to have less people turning against that society. I think that's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't an easy question to answer, but like, why can't prison systems look at this more holistically? Because if you do tackle food, then you tackle physical health and mental health, and surely that's a saving for a prison, just from a financial point of view. I think it's a very outdated... I think public service and, I guess, public sector, and, and I never worked in it before. My background's in the creative industry, and I came into it um, kind of naively, I suppose. And and realised quite quickly that um, it's outdated. Um, you know, there's a lot of red tape. There's a way of doing things and there's a reluctance for change, I think, um, definitely. And yeah, and prisons are 10 years behind society, you know, for the most part, I think. Um, you know, obviously there's always some, some kind of like, yeah, 
some good stuff going on, but for the most part, it just feels, um, I guess, with talking about kind of progressive ideas and, you know, looking at things in a more holistic way, um, that is a very new concept, you know, that's not how they work, I think, and, but that's not to say that they don't want to work in that way, I suppose, and I think um, what I've tried to do is sometimes that's what we're bringing in, you know, often even in the prison kitchen, catering managers got so much to deal with that actually thinking holistically and progressively and, mm -hmm. you know, creatively about dishes is just not, you know, they, they can't do that. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't want to, but it's about how we kind of get that in, I think. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This gentleman at the back, sir. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question about scalability. Um, I work in a prison that has about 1,300 people in it, and I know increasingly in this country we're looking to build bigger and bigger prisons. Um, yeah, I'm, I would love to hear your thoughts on what good practice on a really large scale looks like. Probably as like a second question, will you be going to shape and inform culture in any of the new prisons that are being built in this country? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it was actually, I was thinking about it earlier because I was thinking about the self-sufficiency thing and why that existed 20 years ago and why that doesn't exist now and we work with this centralised supplier and I think, you know, two decades ago the prison population was half of what it is now and obviously the government at the moment have a policy of, of building more prisons, big, building kind of super prisons, longer sentences and locking people up. So um, that kind of population is only going to increase and... It's concerning because actually I think the bigger the population gets, the more we do work towards that kind of centralised approach and, the, and, the, and the, the further we move away from this kind of holistic, more kind of bespoke way of working. So um, I'm not answering your question <laughs> because it's really difficult. And I suppose some of the, the, new, the new prisons as well. Um, yeah, we're not working with any of the new prisons at the moment, but um, I would love to because it's it's a nice opportunity to kind of, I suppose, set, set the bar, I, I guess. Mm. Um, the only thing I, I often find the prison system is, um, you know, particularly the catering managers and catering teams, is that uh, most of them have worked in the prison system for a very long time, have worked at several prisons. Um, a lot of them come from a military background, so mass catering kind of as part of the military. Um, so that's not to say that they don't have good intentions, it's just to say that they are almost kind of institutionalised themselves into a way of, of working. So, and that's why you, you find that, that prison food doesn't differ hugely, you know, across the board. Um, yeah. I guess, I mean, this will be the last question, and it's quite a good one to finish on. Um, and I guess for, for, for all of you, hang on, if I can just find it. What can we, Joe and Joe Public, um, do about addressing this issue? <laughs> you can donate to Food Behind Bars. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think, for me, it's just um, about engaging in the issue, I suppose. And, you know, that is as simple as, you know, coming to something like tonight or um, speaking to someone about it. You know, I think some... You know, I, I always get it. People are like, I've never thought about this before. I've never thought about prison food. And, and most people haven't. So I think even in that, you're kind of doing your, your part, I suppose. Um, yeah, and engaging in some of the, the charities and organisations that are working around the issue. Um, you know, and there are quite a few, actually, um, and kind of supporting their work. And, um, yeah. <laughs> I'd say just have conversations. And yeah. forums like this is a great conversation starter. You know, a lot of people are coming to the subject of food and prisons from ignorance because they don't know, because it isn't spoken about. And by having the ability to share what prison food really is like, people are getting the education, that then starts conversations amongst their peers, and it becomes more of a wider thought, that mm. a wider knowledge bank of actually how food and prison is and what we can do to make it better. Mm. And I would say... Let's take it. Let's take it a level up. Uh -huh. So, um, listen to the Crime and Nourishment podcast. So I did a four-part podcast series that was funded by the Wellcome Trust, which looked into these prison studies, um, and spoke to some of the researchers. And he, he, his quote was, "After you bang your head against a brick wall long enough, you just get a headache." Um, so, listen to the Crime and Nourishment um, series, so that you have a kind of working knowledge of 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 the research, and then. Drop an email to your MP. Mm -hmm. Just be like, hey, <laughs> did you know this? Because it's about getting the conversation, A, having the conversation, but basically getting the conversation to happen in the room where, 
where it happens. Mm. Um, so your MP, if you fancy writing a, a card to a Lord, then do that. Apparently cards oh, yeah. work better lords for law lords. Yeah. Um, so cards for lords or an email for your MP, just so you start getting more people thinking about it, more people in high places thinking about it, so that the next time it ends up on the front of a, of a red top, actually more people have an informed opinion about it. We get a larger conversation and that's, I think it's gonna be political will that drives the agenda. We can treat prison food as a non-issue as long as most of the public don't care. But as soon as the public have something to say about it, then the government has to start listening. So inform and email. And um, we have to stop there, I think. Uh, are you going to close this? That was amazing. Thank you so much. And yeah, I, I think we all got a real sense of the frustration of, of, of working um, in, the, in, this, in this area. But it's actually re re really reassuring to know that there are people like you three kind of working and, um, and, and you know, sort of, yeah, sort of campaigning and, and trying to actually make, make real change. So thank you for what you do. Um, really appreciate it. Um, just to say, there are um, a few copies of Kimberly's book out in the uh, out in the foyer. Um, I forgot to ask if you sign any of them. If you, if you sign it. Sure thing. <laughs> I rather I'm really putting you on the spot, but um, yeah, yeah, like brilliant book. So um, uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you for all your questions. Sorry I didn't get to all the online questions, um, but yeah, you've been brilliant. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.